Welcome back to Kill Rock Radio here on KillRockRadio.com. My name is Rocky. Back up in this son of a bitch. Back at full power now after the uh, the storm and all that shit has come and gone. Uh, we got a few things to talk about here in the world of hard rock and heavy metal. Uh, I got several people who asked me ab- uh, about my take on Gojira and their huge spot where they uh, they played at the uh, Olympics opening ceremony. And a lot of the furor that came about after that, we'll get into that. Also, Aerosmith retiring from the road. Turns out Steven Tyler simply cannot fucking hack it anymore. We'll get into that. And on top of that, of course, we've got your uh, your listener comments and all that good shit. I guess let's go ahead and get into Gojira first. Even though they're not household names, in the metal world, people are aware of Gojira. Your regular person on the street would not know who they were, because that's really where metal is these days. It's, it's not as popular as it once was, to say the least. So that being said, um, they got this spot because, you know, they're a big band in France. And uh, this, the performance itself was, was pure artistry. Like this shit was so fucking heavy. If you know anything about history whatsoever and the French Revolution, the thing started off with the beheaded uh, Marie Antoinette, the head of the beheaded Marie Antoinette going into Gojira with their classic fucking wall of sound. And then from there, this fucking boat comes in and it has this opera singer. And there are absolutely parallels in classical music and metal music in regards to how it's um, composed. So an opera singer can come in and mesh with metal really well. And this was a good example of that. And then with the fucking choir coming in and all that, the, the, the amazing shit they did with the streamers to represent blood. And now the streamers coming off the boat. Oh, it was fucking epic. Everybody says that shit now. Like, oh, that was epic. This was the epitome of what that shit means. If you look at the scope of that performance, Everything about that show was fucking badass. And you know, the funny thing about it is this year, the the opening of the Olympics was mired, slammed, if you will, by, uh, by weirdo Jesus freak motherfuckers who were insisting that this entire thing was organized by agents of the devil himself. Motherfucking Satan. <laughs> Apparently Satan was the producer of the uh, of the Olympics opening ceremony. The devil is a motherfucking liar. So you know I ain't worried. Be hot. Heavy metal as long as it has existed has been nailed with this. They're like, "Oh, it's the devil's music. It's the devil's music." You know, my mom would tell me about when she was a kid getting into the Beatles. Who could imagine something more happy and fun than the Beatles? We play this shit to little children nowadays. And back then, she was scolded for listening to the Beatles, that that was the devil's music. It's something that rock music has been hit with literally since its inception, that it is evil music, it is for fornicators, it is for drug users, and uh, once again, agents of Satan. Laughable, man. (laughs) So that's nothing new to a metal band. I've never seen that shit levied at like an entire production. I mean, this is the Olympics. Everybody points to that fucking, uh, that thing that was supposedly the last supper, except everyone was like drag queens and they had the fucking awesome blue dude on a platter. Are you blue? Only in color, Michael. I understand. Cause when I first saw it, my first thought was the last supper. It was brought up that, that this actually had something to do with, uh, folklore uh, that, that French people were familiar with. Listen, I'm an American. Everything goes back to Jesus where we come from. So if there is another story 
that is similar to the, I guess, the Last Supper or whatever. If you truly follow the teachings of Jesus, when Jesus came to town, he didn't fucking like throw a high class party for the fucking five richest guys in town. He would get together with all the criminals and the fucking prostitutes and the sickies and the cripples and just all the, the people in town that were outcasts because the teachings of Jesus Christ would have you embrace those people. Bitch, I'm flowing straight from the survival scroll. That is something that is lost on a lot of uh, a lot of these current Christians out there who think that apparently their job now is to just fucking point their finger at everything that is Satan. And apparently Gojira is Satan. The little sweet blue boy is Satan. Everything about that thing was Satan. They smell like a pile of bullshit. I have some uh, some comments here. My boy Shadow of Ezra says the opening ceremony of the Olympics is not even hiding satanic rituals anymore. There is no longer anything hidden in plain sight. That doesn't make sense at all. These are the demonic dark forces of Satan who wants to eclipse the light. You can already see skulls, motifs of death, satanic red lighting, children trapped in tunnels. Did anyone notice that the single rider on a pale horse is straight out of the book of Revelation? Look, you fucking chunky pumpkin head. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Of course, they have all the examples. One of those is Gojira. Gojira's performance is 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 exactly about the French Revolution. Uh, a little bit of Les Miserables. Marie Antoinette was a real person. She was beheaded. And, and this is what these fuckheads do. I don't know if they're just dumb themselves or if it's just like to rabble rouse dumb motherfuckers who don't who don't know simple shit. And, and I'm not saying I'm some history buff, but I went to school. You know, we, in America, we celebrate um, July 4th. We celebrate our own uh, independence in the way that we know how. We fucking gorge all day. And then we vomit and fucking piss and shit ourselves from being so goddamn drunk. And that's what we do. The French, you know, these are these people put on high, high brow entertainment. These are the people who created Cirque du Soleil. This is their love language. This is how they do. If you said to me, hey, this year the Olympics are on are, are in France. Uh, if the French go ahead and put on that opening ceremony, do you think there's going to be any like drag queens and leotards? I'd say, yeah, probably. I mean, knowing the French, that's some shit. They're going to be on strings. They're going to be floating in the air and flipping around. Uh, somebody pointed out the pale horse or whatever. Once again, that refers to French folklore as well. And you're just applying your own bullshit to it because your whole business is being a dickhead online who rabble rouses other fucking idiots who know nothing of history. It's not their fault that you're so stupid that you don't understand the history that they're referencing. That's on you. Why don't you go fucking read something? Not, don't even read a book. Just Google it. These are things that happened in history. I already know you motherfuckers hate science. Now you're going to tell me we can't, we can't look at history either. My homie Gav says this satanic panic stuff is so 1983, LOL. The severed head is the French Revolution and the band Gojira make really wholesome songs about nature, cleaning up garbage, saving the whales, protecting forests, etc. Calm the fuck down. That's the thing. Dumb motherfuckers, they're embarrassed because there are times where it becomes clear to them. They're fucking idiots and that they don't like that. That's why you always see scientists and shit. You look at it back in the dark ages, those motherfuckers would get killed, killed out in the streets. And my homie Rod Breslau says Gojira's Olympics performance has created an international incident with Christians around the world panicking and preparing for the rise of a satanic new world order. Metal is so back. And I, dude, I hope that's the case. Anytime you can get a metal band front and center for the world to see, uh, you know, this is the forum for a band like Gojira because metal bands, heavy metal bands, rock bands, hard rock bands, to me, nobody can put on shows like those motherfuckers. You can't match the emotion. 
you can't match uh the the, the, the just the feeling the buzz that you get from a from a, like a heavy metal crowd or a rock crowd and Gojira, you know, they're fucking, you know, they're taking advantage of this whole thing because they're going on the road opening for corn. At this point, people might want to see Gojira as the opener there over corn. Uh, but I know here in Houston, I saw uh, several ads and, uh, and, and news stories and shit like that. Oh, you want to see that band from the Olympics? They're coming to town opening for corn. So if, if you see them coming to your town, absolutely go check them out. Gojira is a fantastic band. Uh, not satanic at all. If anything, they, they do like hippie ass fucking progressive metal. It's it's brilliant stuff. Check them out if you're not familiar. Anyways, moving on. One of the one of the greatest American rock and roll bands is throwing in the towel. Yet another one bites the dust as Aerosmith have retired from touring due to Steven Tyler, their lead singer, uh, having a vocal injury that has now ended his career. You know, there are people out there who have said that Aerosmith is the greatest American rock band. And if you look at their level of influence from the 70s, and then they sort of flame out in the 70s, they come back in the 80s, sort of riding the coattails of Run DMC and almost accidentally creating the first rap rock shit. They ride that back to prominence from there. They had a run in the 80s that was just big time. Dude looks like a lady. Uh, Jamie got a gun. Loving an elevator. Uh, you could go on and on. There were a shit ton of Aerosmith hits all through the 80s into the 90s and you just simply cannot deny uh, the greatness of Aerosmith. So on that level, it does suck. You know, it's it's one more all-time great band that's just not out there anymore. The band released a statement uh, saying it was 1970 when a spark of inspiration became Aerosmith. Thanks to you, our Blue Army, that spark caught flame and has been burning for over five decades. Some of you have been with us since the beginning and all of you are the reason we made rock and roll history. It has been the honor of our lives to have our music become part of yours in every club, on every massive tour, and at moments grand and private, you have given us a place in the soundtrack of your lives. We've always wanted to blow your minds when performing. As you know, Steven's voice is an instrument like no other. He has spent months tirelessly working on his voice to get where it was before his injury. We've seen him struggling despite having the best medical team by his side. Sadly, it's clear that a full recovery from his vocal injury is not possible. We have made a heartbreaking and difficult but necessary decision as a band of brothers to retire from the touring stage. We are grateful beyond words for everyone who was pumped to get on the road with us one last time, grateful to our expert crew, our incredible team, and the thousands of talented people who've made our historic runs possible. A final thank you to you, the best fans on planet Earth. Play our music loud now and always. Dream on. You've made our dreams come true. Uh, so a beautiful, uh, a beautiful sentiment there. There are millions and millions of people out there who have been affected by this band, who have gone out to see this band. And really, I started off saying one of the greatest American bands of all time, really one of the greatest rock and roll bands, period. Uh, if you look at their numbers, if you look at the just the volume of hits and hit albums. And when they say that their career has spanned five decades, that's no shit. It's not like they had, you know, a handful of hits in the first 10 years that they rode for the rest of their career. It's not the case. Aerosmith had hits in the seventies, the eighties, the nineties, the early aughts. And it was around there that they pretty much fell off and were not able to, to make hits anymore. Um, from there, what people probably remember Aerosmith from most these days is Steven Tyler being on American Idol. And that's really a sad thing because Steven Tyler, in my estimation, is one of the creepiest 
uh, he's on he's on my list of like top 10 just like total pieces of shit in rock music oddly enough once again i can separate the artist from the art i do like a lot of aerosmith songs there's a lot of them that i enjoy but steven tyler himself if you've ever listened to him speak he has a sliminess about him that people for some reason find charming maybe it's because he's famous that they're you know we tend to just let famous people kind of do whatever the fuck they want from the very first time i ever heard this dude speak he came off just just uh i don't want to say a predator because that you know all the connotations that come with that although there are some things you could point to during his run on American Idol. He was such a fucking creep that it became like a weekly thing that uh, Jimmy Kimmel would keep track of, of you know, the, the Steven Tyler creepy leer of the week or some shit like that. And Steven Tyler at that point is in his 60s. Steven Tyler added a little extra something to American Idol every week. You know, he'd zero in on the female contestants. He'd stare at them like a hungry cheetah stalking a, a gazelle. And I miss that. Hi, what's your name? Holly. And how old are you? I'm 17. Um... I mean, he was regularly inappropriate and I'm not like a clutch at my pearls type dude. You're so cute and precious. I guess Steven Tyler got sued for writing about the time that he essentially adopted a teenager so he could fuck her and take her across state lines and not get arrested. That girl grew up and Steven Tyler wrote something about her in his memoir where he just really was like in a very creepy fashion remembering his time fucking this 16 year old. And that woman, you know, was kind of like, hey, dude, I'm an adult now. So could you not talk about that weird time in my life? The wording, I got to look it up. It was, um, okay, here it is. Uh, th this is the way th he wrote this. A lot of these celebrities, they have a ghost writer it, they essentially interview you and they write your life story from that interview. The way this is written, it, it really does give you a peek into how this dude speaks. And it's just fucking, it makes you want to vomit. Here's him bragging about fucking a 16 year old when he was, uh, well, let me see, 26 quote with my bad self being 26 and she barely old enough to drive and sexy as hell. I just fell madly in love with her. She was a cute, skinny little tomboy dressed up as little Bo Peep. She was my heart's desire, my partner in crimes of passion. You know, I I'm not somebody who feels like, oh, dude, you're 64. You shouldn't be fucking like a 38 year old. I understand that's a giant spread in age, but a 38 year old, they're making an informed decision. And you know, you're at the age where if, if you are fucking up, you kind of should know better and it's on you. But at that age, at 16 years old, he wanted to take her on the road with him. And of course you can't do that because that's called sex trafficking. Uh, so he got her parents, I think it was just her mom, to sign over essentially guardianship. So he was now her guardian. And, uh, and he took her on the road. And as she said, he fucked her a bunch. I think he knocked her up multiple times. Uh, of course, none of those children were ever born. And his words to me were that I had to have the abortion right now or the doctors wouldn't do it because I was so far along. I just kept saying no until he placed the decision between him and the baby. But yeah, the way he talks about it, he says a skinny little tomboy. When in a girl's life do we tend to refer to her as being a tomboy? You know what I'm saying? Think about that. That's normally when they're like little kids, when they're like 12 years old, when they're, you know, that's what he thought was hot was that she was so young looking. It's just disgusting. So anyways, I fucking did a story about that. And in our comments, we have some, we had somebody talk about their own experience with Steve and Tyler fucking with them. Here, I'll, I'll pull this up because I don't know if I ever actually read these. Okay. This was sent directly to us from bell in hell. Thank you for telling it like it is and not putting her down. He's stronger than he looks for a skinny little guy. If he put her name in his book, then she should be given the book sales. 
He assaulted me twice in front of people and I was lucky enough to get away and run away, which of course I responded to like, holy shit, you know, I'm sorry that happened to you, whatever. I'm glad you made it out, all that good stuff. And uh, she says, I enjoyed listening to your show as a victim of that man when I was 15. He just grabbed me on a street in broad daylight, didn't even speak to me especially nicely and suddenly threw me into a phone booth and molested me while people watched. I wanted to die. And when I'm on my deathbed, if someone utters his name, I'm going to die humiliated, which sounds very heavy to me. So that's all, all I'm saying. The guy, he's a fucking, he's an all time great lead singer. Uh, he is really the epitome of what a lot of the, the rock star mythos is all about. But at the same time, He's done some incredibly gross shit. I, you know, I remember in his, I believe it was in his book, he made some comment about him and his guitarist, like got, got crabs from the same four way or something. Yeah, here it is from his memoir. And I quote, once again, this is in Tyler's own words. I remember one night on the road when Joe and I were sharing a bed with two girls and woke up in the morning with a seafood blue plate special crabs for everybody like it's a big funny fucking thing to get crabs that's fucking disgusting dude i mean i guess i'm a pretty sick guy imagine what this dude's life is like if, if getting crabs has been like normal to him it's been normalized in his life uh lol me and my buddy got crabs from this from fucking the same woman that's that's gross controversial i know and not only is he not ashamed he's writing about it with fucking exclamation points and jokes and all that shit rapist here uh it, it, here he he writes about uh his first sexual experience at age seven with french twins he says they took me home one day and we had a sh you show me yours i'll show you mine session isn't that great you know, I look at their pictures now and think to myself, how much sweeter does it get? And isn't it crazy that my wife, Teresa, was a twin and my girlfriend now is a twin? Okay, let's break that statement down. When you were seven, some twins flashed you the beaver and you in turn showed them your ween. Okay, but when you say, I look at their pictures now, why do you have pictures of these seven-year-old twins? And why do you look at it and say, oh man, it doesn't get any sweeter than that. It, looking at seven-year-olds beavers? What the fuck, man? So I, I just, I want to put it out there. I want to, at the same time, salute Aerosmith for being one of the greatest rock bands of all fucking time. And at the same time, say, thank God that Steven Tyler is not going to be out on the road anymore. He's lucky his ass never went to jail. He should fucking just go somewhere and sit the fuck down, enjoy the fruits of his labor, try to just, you know, really soak in how fucking lucky you've been. But anyways, sorry about the tangent. Uh, we'll move on. All right, so let's go ahead and get to your comments. Info at killrockradio.com is where you would send your comments to us directly or simply get up in our DMs, comment on any of our shit, and, uh, and we'll get back to you ASAP. So after last episode, we did have a lot of comments about Tenacious D and a little bit of an update. Now, since our story, Jack Black has, uh, he, he was doing a whole press tour for Borderlands, uh, a film he did some voiceover work in, which has already come out and bombed big time. He's been on all these podcasts where they're just throwing him like bullshit softball questions. They try to give him a little something about Tenacious D at the end. Finally, Jack did come out and say, yes, in fact, Tenacious D, Kyle Gass and Jack Black are still friends. Uh, he said that, of course, they're going to get back together. As far as I'm concerned, that was a direct reaction to the backlash. If you look back to his original, uh, his original tweet in his tweet, he said, I no longer feel it's appropriate to continue the Tenacious D ch tour and all future creative plans are on hold. Now you, you juxtapose that with his recent thing where he's on these fucking podcasts. He's like, of course, we're going to get back together. Of course. It's a very different vibe. 
And I think the difference is that some time has passed and everybody has had their comments. And I think a lot of people have agreed with me that Jack Black, uh, that it was a shitty look to throw Kyle Gass under the bus. And I think whatever anger he would have had in the moment, he's probably gotten over. And now it's like, okay, well, we'll do something else down the road. So that's a good thing. You know, Kyle Gass, it means he gets to keep his job. So overall, it seems to have worked itself out. Now, we did have a lot of comments. A lot of people were saying similar stuff. So I sort of grabbed the few that kind of got everyone's points across. You know what I'm saying? So first, I got an unnamed user here who said, I saw that clip, but I noticed it was not Jack Black that said it, but the other guy just sounded like Jack. See, I think this might have something to do with Jack's over-the-top response is that Kyle Gass outside of actually being in Tenacious D, he's not a famous guy. He can walk down the street and no one's going to recognize him. When he's not in Tenacious D, he's pretty much just a dude. Also, Tenacious D has come to a point right now to where like they're not getting any new fans. Like their fan base is their fan base, but they're not actively putting out new songs. Uh, when they put out a new album, you don't ever see Jack Black out supporting it or promoting it or anything like that. If you look at the way it's treated, it's treated very much as like a, a side bitch hobby by Jack Black. So the fact that this happened and Jack Black has been so involved in this most recent uh, political cycle, this uh, this this election cycle, because he's been raising money for the Democratic Party. And in this case, Kamala Harris. So I think that's what scared the shit out of Jack is that he thought this was going to directly reflect upon him when I really think he just could have come out and they could have done some sort of joint. I'm sorry that this even happened. And I think they would have been fine because once again, who gives a f I mean, you can't hurt Kyle Gass other than kicking him out of Tenacious D because that's that's all he does. Uh, obviously they did a movie together. They've done TV shows together. They've toured the world together to throw the guy right the fuck under the bus. Very, uh, very shitty, shady thing to do. If you ask me next bougie non hater. I don't know what the fuck your name is, sir. Or madam says Jackson, Uber liberal. And even he recognizes when someone has gone too far. Uh, Jack is very liberal. It had gone too far. Um, it, it really was a case of probably too soon at the same time, you know, it, it, it's, it's just, it's a show in Australia. You wouldn't think that it would cause the uproar that it caused, but you know, here we are next. My homie cad guy says an example of how you don't have the same rights in other countries that you, that you do here. He dug his own grave, how fitting and sad at the same time. Here in the United States of America, you can say whatever the fuck you want. Um, I support that right. I support Kyle's right to say what he said. Um, but, and I mean, this is the case across the board, regardless of your political affiliation. Though you are free to say whatever the fuck you want, you are not free from consequence. And when you're kind of, you know, shooting from the hip like Kyle was at that show, who knows if they had had any drinks or gotten stoned or whatever. You cut it loose, you get in trouble. I mean, I had heard some stuff. I don't even know if this is completely true, but I had heard some shit that like the Australian government was trying to revoke their passport or some shit like that. I really wish that people would pay attention when shit like this happens. If true, for the Australian government to go out of their way to even make a statement on, on an American band that made a joke about American politics and you want to give them some sort of, of a heat back in Australia. If I'm the Australian people, I'd say, worry about your own fucking job, stupid asshole. Australia, I've never been. I assume it could be better. Even if it's great, I assume it could be better. And it'd be better if your paid public officials are not wasting taxpayer time to worry about fucking tenacious D. I hate that shit in American politics, but I understand in America, we export entertainment of all sorts. So, you know, it, it, it makes sense to me, but in Australia, shut the fuck up. Let these guys go the fuck home. If they want to come back, let them come back. They didn't do anything wrong. They made a fucking joke. And we'll finish with my homeboy skinny ninja 420. 
who says, I stand with Kyle's right to make bad jokes as a comedian. Shame on Jack. You could not have typed it out better than you did here. This is exactly what I feel. Regardless of what uh, type of entertainment you're involved in across the board, you know, whether you're talking about writing, acting, painting, comedy, and comedy is a form of art. It's, it's writing, it's uh, performance. If you're not pushing barriers, if you're not trying new shit, then I kind of get to feeling like, what the fuck are you doing? What's funny is subjective. When you say something in the moment that you think is funny, it's quite possible that it's going to be, uh, you know, um, offensive. It's quite possible that you're going to hurt someone's feelings or something like that. A lot of comedy is sort of pointed at uh, a different person or group or whatever. If we're talking about freedom, then really either all jokes are okay or no jokes are okay. Um, if a guy came out and he said, Hey man, I'm the Nazi comedian. And he did nothing but make jokes about like fucking you know, throwing Jewish people in an oven during the Holocaust or like lynching black people in the fifties or sixties. To me, it's incredibly poor taste. Um, I, I think anyone who would find humor in that is fucking vile, but at the same time, it's your right to make the jokes. Everything can be offensive. What if you want to make a joke about like, oh man, what about airline food? What if I'm an airline chef and now I'm offended because you've talked shit about airline food? Everything can be offensive. Everything has the potential to be offensive. And when we start trying to tiptoe around that, we lose the realism and the truth. And, uh, the, you know, everybody who, who loves comedy can tell you the best comedians are the ones who can dig out the humor from, from everyday life and the things that we can all agree upon the things that are true. I like when there's no stops on what people are allowed to say, because I think that we use language to mask a lot of the ugly shit in our world. And as a result, it leaves us naive. We don't know what the fuck's going on half the time. I like a world where everyone puts everything on the fucking table. And if you're a dumb racist fuck, I'd like to know that off the bat. So I don't have to deal with you when everything's on the table, then we're all free. You know what I'm saying? This is America, dude. Like anytime you have one of these, like uh, super hardcore piece of shit, people like, like the Andrew Tate's of the world or whatever, it shouldn't be about saying, Hey man, Andrew Tate shouldn't be allowed to say that. I say, let him say this shit so we know exactly who he is. And then the people that follow him, you can know exactly who they are. They're pieces of shit too. And uh, like, that's how you get through life. That's how you can uh, keep from getting fucked over so much. There's no way to never get fucked over. Cause you know, so many people you meet in life, they're complete bullshit. Imagine how great the world would be if people didn't try to censor anything and you could just say whatever the fuck you want and people could know who you are. Sometimes that's a vile thing and people could know, stay away from that motherfucker. That guy's a piece of shit. My homie Bristol PKA says, I hate I tapped your channel and gave you clicks and you can't take them back motherfucker. My shit is monetized. So thank you very much. Next, my homegirl Kristen's said congrats on having the most annoying intro on YouTube. I did clarify with her. Was she talking about the song or the little, the buzzing light thing at the front? She said the buzzing light thing at the front. Listen, Kristen, I'm not taking it out. The problem is if you've listened to the show, you know, I have an issue with cursing and potty mouth and all that shit. This show, I don't write the fucking thing. I don't read it off a prompter. I make it up as I go. Uh, so it's, it's essentially like a stream of consciousness thing. And my inner dialogue is filthy and I'm aware there are times where I'm talking and people just start staring at me and I see just the disgust <laughs> with the, you know, the stuff I say or like the, what the fuck or whatever. So I'm aware 
that some of the shit that I say, first off, as again, once again, it's filthy. Secondly, it might be very adult. Some of the themes might be fucked up. And YouTube is just, there's so many kids on YouTube. So if you're going to come in here, just know this is not a safe space uh, for people that are easily offended. This is not a safe space for people who don't like cursing people who are afraid to keep it real. So yeah, it's not for everyone. I am not going to change the opening though, because I made that shit myself. And when I made it, I said, I want it to be almost annoying. I want it to be like a buzzer that gets your attention and you look up and you say, Oh, okay, this is going to be filthy. And if you're somebody who listens to the channel, if you're at work and you hear the bzz, bzz, that's almost like an alarm, get the fuck out. If anyone else is going to hear your shit, uh, that you're like concerned about it being safe for work or not. Uh, so yeah, I'm sorry, Kristen. It's not going anywhere. At some point I may change the intro. If I ever do, I will likely keep some version of the opening buzzer thing because, uh, cause I need motherfuckers to know you're not just walking into some simple basic ass shit. You're getting in on some nasty shit. <laughs> Understand you motherfucker. Thank you guys so much for listening to the show. Info at killrockradio.com is where you would email us directly. Or as I said, get up in our DMs, comment on any of our shit, and uh, we will get back to you ASAP. Uh, if you guys want to support the channel, go to killrockradio.com and get some of that merch, baby. We got, uh, right now we got two things. We got a koozie to keep your little fingers warm and dry when you got a nice frosty beverage, whether it's a brew dog, a soda, a seltzer, a weed seltzer, a weed drink of some form, a fucking wine in a can, whatever you got, you're gonna keep your little sweet hands dry and warm. Also, uh, we got a sticker, it's of the devil. I illustrated that myself. So that shit is a Rocky original. It's a, uh, I believe it's two inches by, is it? I think it's either two inch by two inch or three inch by three inch. It's it's not huge. So if you, you can get that, slap it on the back of your computer, put it on your luggage, put it somewhere where you want people to know that you're fucking awesome. Both are nice little affordable options and every dollar goes back into the show. I mentioned getting a new intro, maybe at some point getting a new, I don't know what the fuck this is, but this is just my office, but we'll do something. But anyways, go to killrockradio.com and get that merch. Um, we'll be adding stuff as time goes on. Pretty much if you guys buy this shit, I'll take that money and I'll flip it over into some new merch. Uh, if you have any ideas, any shit that you want, if, do you want a t-shirt? Do you want a, a, a cock ring? I could get a cock ring. I've got the hookups to get a, 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 a branded cock ring. So I don't know anything you guys have ideas of. Once we sell through this merch, I'll use that money to go buy the other merch and, uh, and we'll sell that shit back to you too. So thank you guys very much. Let's keep this conversation going next time. And until then, I will talk to you crazy motherfuckers later. Peace. Got any questions or comments? Send them to info at killrockradio.com. To keep up with the latest and catch up on past interviews and clips, search Kill Rock Radio on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Subscribe to Kill Rock Radio wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm like, oh my God, just listen to it already. Wherever you listen to podcasts.